Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Mysteries and Disappearances video. Alright, let's go ahead and let's do another entry here. This one actually one that I picked myself just randomly from a list. Something that showcases disappearances before 1910. You know me, those of you that have followed my playlist for a while know that I tend to favor the disappearances from way back then. These are a great way to showcase their information and then ponder and wonder what exactly happened to them. In some cases, some people disappearing more than a hundred years ago. Such is the case with this woman that you're looking at here. She was someone that in reading all of her information, her life definitely reads like something straight of either almost a soap opera down to actually a movie of the week. I mean, the twists and turns associated with her are definitely something that would make some great uh, film or TV material. But her name was Ida Hillis Addis, and there may be even a twist at the end involving her actually not even quote unquote disappearing. In fact, you'll know more about that here in a minute. So let's go ahead and let's talk about her info here. And then I'd uh, love to see what your thoughts are afterward if she truly did disappear or if uh, otherwise her real identity was known afterwards. So here's essentially what happened. She was someone that was born back in 1857. No exact time period with regards to that, but at least the location was in Leavenworth, Kansas. 1857, wow, whole different era, right, when it came to that, when it came to the early days of America. Eventually, though, her family ended up moving to Chihuahua, Mexico, and this was during the start of the American Civil War. This was the time period where she was able to move around that location, gather a lot of information, speak Spanish, I believe also speak, read, and write Spanish. This became notable because later on, she would be considered the first American writer to actually work on translating Mexican stories and some of their ancient histories into English. So she was someone that was definitely, again, using that type of translation abilities to uh, her advantage. But yeah, she would travel over there with the family over the frontier areas, going into villages, going into miners' camps, and so on. Eventually, at a young age of 15, her and her family moved back into the States, and then she was able to graduate. Um, this was in Los Angeles. She was able to graduate there from a high school, very small class, seven students, Hard to believe, right, how small those classes were. And then eventually she began being a teacher to other kids as well. But yeah, she would use her writing skills to be able to do a bunch of things. In fact, she was someone that had works involving ghost stories. She created um, dramas involving love triangles. She was someone that also focused on American feminism stories. Um, she submitted her stories to multiple places as well, including publications like The Californian, Harper's Monthly, Los Angeles Herald, Chicago Times, and so on. So she was definitely, again, using her writing skills to be able to post all of these newspaper articles and periodicals. And at the same time, she would travel both in and out of the country part as part of her journeys, as part of her um, uh, literature journeys as well. And so that was a great way for her to experience and write about that firsthand. Where things took a different turn, though, seemed to be with her love life. This is where things, again, more went on the lines of a soap opera stance. Apparently, at a young age, she was introduced to the former governor of California, a guy by the name of John G. Downey. And he was someone that was much older than her. And when his own sisters realized what was happening, that they were uh, forming a romantic relationship, they must have not liked it because they actually ended up, for lack of a better term, kidnapping him or taking him against his will over to Ireland. And so when that happened, that's when um, she in turn sued him for what was considered a breach of promise. But then shortly before that time period, that's when uh, I guess it either was resolved or something else happened where she ended up actually moving to Mexico 
uh, because at that point she was, I guess, starting to get away. There was a lot of bad things that were happening with that case, including bringing up testimony involving adultery. And she was also accused of that as well with another party. This was another person, a, uh, a person, an editor by the name of Theodore Jesterfield, who ended up su uh, not only divorcing his wife, but the wife actually sued as well and named Ida Hillis Addis as a co-defendant. So for those keeping track already, in this case, she in turn was uh, working on some kind of a lawsuit against John Jean Downey. And then afterward, she was accused of being involved with some kind of adultery with Theodore Jesterfield, also again turning into a lawsuit. And then she began working on a book at that same time. And then afterward, married someone, a guy by the name of Charles A. Stork, someone who helped her not just with the publication of the book, but was able to assist her with some financial matters. And so they ended up getting married on September 10th, 1890. And I guess things went good for just maybe a couple of years. But then afterward, his teenage son did not like her. And then she started accusing him, this Charles A. Stork, of being bad against her, like causing some kind of physical or emotional abuse as well. And so she ended up going actually uh, through a divorce and she was involved in yet another lawsuit of sorts with that. In fact, she was even committed uh, on the ground uh, to some kind of mental asylum on the grounds of being insane. So this was something where he was accusing her of having this form of insanity. And then she was involved with another lawsuit with, in this case, a hospital called Cottage Hospital, where she was treated, but she was charged with some kind of fee. She ended up losing it. And then eventually the actual trial, the divorce for herself and Charles A. Stork ended up going into a uh, motion on December 28th, 1894, and it was eventually resolved, but in favor of Charles Stork. But during this time period, that's when she found out that him and their and her attorney were actually working together. So maybe they were doing something as it was described duplicitous behind the scenes. So when she found out about this, when she found out that this was happening, and uh, this obviously could have resulted in why that she had that bad luck, that bad favor when it came to the trial, she actually broke into the attorney's home and she had two guns with her, threatened to shoot that attorney, actually fired a shot. It didn't hit anybody, but it still, it, it was a situation involving a gun actually being fired. Police were called on her. She was placed back in jail. She ended up spending eight months total in jail and also ended up spending a little bit more, about a year or so, in a different lawsuit involving a libel case. This may have been tied to that book she was writing because it was a book about uh, biographies of some prominent citizenry. Who knows if maybe somebody there um, uh, stated, you know, they didn't like essentially what was being printed. But yeah, eventually she was released in May of 1900. And then she tried again with that lawsuit involving her and her former ex, Charles A. Stork. But that was dismissed as well. And then finally, long, uh, things were kind of wrapping up on her end. And she was asking for alimony. Things took a different turn on that end because um, the, the, the former husband, Charles A. Stork, refused to pay anything involving alimony, let alone the 500 that she was asking for. And instead, one more time, had her committed to an insane asylum. Isn't this weird? So several times now, she's been accused of being insane. Several times now, she's been in jail. Several times now, she's been in um, an insane asylum. And several times now, she's lost all these lawsuits and been involved in other type of, of lawsuits as well. All of this through the myriad of relationships that she was having but where things take a different turn is this she actually escaped from the asylum and that was lead to this current disappearance status somewhere along the way she escaped 
was never ever seen again and it's presumed that she basically just disappeared off the face of the earth no one was able to find her at least as her um, status as Ida Hillis Addis anymore and that was the last that anyone has seen from her it was presumed that she was deceased at a later point but on yet another soap opera angle there's this Apparently, when she escaped, there's a theory that she actually ended up moving to another location. In this case, it was moving back to the Texas area, and there she assumed a whole new identity. Um, it was known as Adelaida Hillis Jackson. So she added like the YDA of her first name into another name, almost as like a little wink of sorts. But yeah, she was there. She was living with yet another person in this case a husband by the name of grant jackson and they ended up spending her remaining years about 30 17 years ago there and then moving to san francisco and then moving to mexico and so on so if you believe that angle then her last uh after her disappearance then her last set of years were all essentially living out in the open but under a different guise and basically starting over but things also took a tragic turn here because it said that during that same time period during especially the last decade the last 10 years of her life she ended up going yet again back to a state hospitals and she ended up passing away there crazy stuff right uh this is the kind of stuff again that would make a great movie of the week each episode being one separate um, uh, montage of what's happening in her um, almost mile a minute type life. But ultimately, if you believe that other angle, it ended up being where she died in 1941 under a different guise in a state hospital. Again, being committed for some form of insanity. But that's it. That's pretty much all the info linked to Ida Hillis Addis. So let me know what you guys think. Does she really have all this activity and then just escaped that asylum and there was nowhere to be found presumably dying somewhere else or did you think that she went over to the texas area started a whole new life another husband and then went into the state hospital let me know what you guys think all right everybody thanks again as always take care bye